Hello, and welcome to session three, workshop 10, Disrupting Traditional Approaches to School Discipline, Literacy Practices to Teach Students Not Suspend. Audience, if you are enjoying the learning today, you can pay the joy forward by going to the Ed Collab site and finding out how you can donate to Grace Smith House, our adopted charity. Grace Smith House is a private, not-for-profit domestic violence agency providing both residential and non-residential services for victims of domestic violence and their children. Because the Ed Collab gathering is a day of free learning, we invite you to donate what you would have spent on coffee, lunch, or even registration for an amazing day like this. Pay it forward to support others. Today, we welcome Dana and Justin Anayemi for their session, Disrupting Traditional Approaches to School Discipline, Literacy Practices to Teach Students Not to Spend Them. Dana is an associate with the Educator Collaborative. This school year will be her 11th year teaching intermediate students in a high needs school district in a suburb west of Chicago, Illinois. Currently, she's working towards completion of a doctoral degree in literacy from Judson University. Dana's research interests include teacher leadership, social justice literacies, literacy curriculum, professional development, and systems leadership. Justin Aniemi is the assistant principal inter of intervention at Hoffman Estates High School in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. He's been an educator for 11 years, serving as teacher, dean, and now an administrator. His background as a teacher was in science, but he also has a master's in reading and an ESL endorsement. Justin's passion as an educator is in recognizing the unique identities of students and supporting all through equitable, respectful practice. If you're on Twitter today, audience, you can share your learning using the hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering, a space, and the number 10. And now I'm excited to introduce Dana and Justin Aniem. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we're both very excited to present today. Um, already listening to Charles R. Smith Jr.'s mm -hmm. keynote and uh, some of the other presentations in the Ed Collab gathering. It's just a wonderful opportunity to be with educators mm -hmm. who are you know, looking for the best things for our students. And so we're excited to present today on uh, discipline and literacy. Mm -hmm. Very excited. Uh, with that being said, I want to just get right into discipline and the definition that you might have for for discipline. Um, you know, if you go to the next slide, Jessica, um, this would be like Webster's version of what discipline is. Mm -hmm. And as I read through those definitions, uh, Dana and I said none of those match with what <laughs> with what we think discipline is or should be. Uh, we said which one is the most tolerable, and we both said maybe number three. If I read number three, it says training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties of more or moral character. Uh, we find some of that problematic, you know, correcting. It's just like there's a right and there's a wrong and you are wrong and you need to be corrected by the authority, by the adult, by the staff member, whatever it may be. Um, what that kind of made me think of as an administrator is we were, I often talk to students individually. Um, a lot of times these are my African-American students about code switching and how it's like, there's a way that you can speak when you're with your friends or at home. And then there's a way that you should conduct yourself here at school. And although I, I kind of understand, obviously, if I'm having that conversation, there's a reason behind it. Uh, but on the flip side, as it became more of something we talked about, it was like, well, now I'm just saying your way is bad and this mm -hmm. way is good and you can't be who you are. I would mm -hmm. much rather think we create a school and an environment where people can be who they are and be embraced and be accepted. Yeah, I know I've I've definitely had to teach my fifth grade students the concept of code switching. And when you look at it through that lens of discipline and embracing, you know, all of the different types of identities that the students bring with them, we just we really struggled with even that term, but we knew that that there's still this idea that we need order and discipline. And, and so with that, that brings us to um, Paulo Freire's from the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And we wanted to share a powerful quote that really shapes our perspective and our lens when we're thinking about discipline. So it says, education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate the integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity, or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. 
And the, the thing I love most about this quote is those last two words, their world, that really students within themselves, each of us within ourselves, we have a whole world within us and we're bringing all of our different worlds together in the spaces that we share. And this is really at the root of, of our ideas that we're gonna share with you throughout yeah. the session. Um, in my role, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people that gets those referral, the behavior referrals that come in. And one of the number one referrals we get is insubordination. Mm -hmm. And again, if I look up the term insubordination in a dictionary, it doesn't really match with what a, a school should be if we're trying to reach students and bring them along, knowing that there's going to be days and, and times where you can't hold it together mm -hmm. behavior wise. And, uh, and I know I don't always hold it together <laughs> exactly. personally. I, I've and had a couple of bad days here and there. And we're the adults, but it's just like, um, you know, compliance. When mm -hmm. I hear insubordination, it's like, we expect you to comply and you did not comply. So here's your referral. And we need to get away from that type of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it's not beneficial to the students or to the overall environment of a school. Exactly. Which is why we really are pushing for all of us to become global meaning makers. And in um, a recent issue of the Journal of Literacy Research, um, Tierney wrote about this concept of global meaning making. And it's kind of a way to exist in your world. He says, Global meaning makers should be contemplative as they reconcile their complicity, complicity with their own privilege and adopt dispositions and approaches that are not presumptuous, colonizing, or recolonizing. And this is just a really powerful way to think about our work when we're thinking about behavior and schools and discipline, putting those words together how can we become global meaning makers and see their struggles and their challenges as something a little bit different? Something we're going to talk about throughout this presentation is just authentically listening to students and understanding where they're coming from, meet them where they are at. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, uh, we can't be placing value judgments on, on their experiences. Um, they're, they're not finished products. Mm -hmm. And as children, they don't have necessarily all the control of, of the environment they're being brought up in and that type of thing. And so that is a huge part of, of being a global meaning maker. So throughout our presentation, we're going to share, we, we kind of narrowed it down to our three biggest, you know, um, strategies, I suppose. They're not really strategies, I guess, way of being to key try, ideas, yeah. key, key ideas to try to strive towards becoming global meaning makers when we think about how to help support our students and and all of the ways that that can look in the school. Yeah, so our first one is called is just text immersion. And it was so nice to hear uh, Charles R. Smith Jr.'s opening keynote uh, because that's exactly what he was talking about is we have to uh, read and write and just be a part of, of literacy. And mm -hmm. on this slide, we wrote text in quotation marks. And, and that's because I think we need to get away also from thinking of it as a very in a very traditional sense of it's this, it's a book and it's this type of book mm -hmm. um, and really expand. And, and Dana and I both try to bring in poetry and graphic novels and podcasts and song audio lyrics. books and song lyrics and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things that are, are more likely to reach a higher number of students and, and engage them. Uh, because when we talk about mm -hmm. discipline again and, Every time I say that word, it's going to kind of be with a little bit of a tone in, in my voice with a little cringe. But when we talk about that, I think oftentimes what we're not talking about is that a kid might not be engaged with what's going on. And so uh, the text that we choose should be a variety of different types, but they should also come from a variety of different sources and, and, and different backgrounds in terms of the characters that are mm -hmm. talked about, in terms of the authors. Mm -hmm. um, kids should be able to see themselves in the texts that are being used in classrooms. And I'd say <clears throat> arming myself and collecting all of these stories and poems and song lyrics and memes and all of those things as a collector of texts, you know, I, I think about the different types of struggles that students have and I'm always thinking of particular students in mind as I'm listening or reading. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really powerful. So we are immersing this presentation in texts 
And so to get started, I'd like to read from a picture book. So we're talking discipline from K-12 and the types of text. So I'm going to be reading from this text, same, same, but different, just a excerpt, um, just to kind of see that even though at kindergarten, first grade, fifth grade for me, or all the way up through high school, when we talk about discipline more often than not, um, or or really anything in education. Right, all education. We, we yeah. kind of talk a little bit too much, but <laughs> I would say that as we talk, we realize that our stories as educators who are global meaning makers is the same in a lot of really exciting, great ways, mm -hmm. but also the same in a lot of really problematic ways. So this is Same, Same, But Different by Jenny Sue Kostecki Shaw. In art class, I painted a picture of my world my teacher mailed it across the oceans. A boy drew back with the colors of the sea. This is my world. Same, same, but different. P.S. Who are you? <laughs> this is me. My name is Elliot, and I love to climb trees. My name is Kailash, and I love to climb trees too. Same, same, but different. P.S. Do you live in a tree? <laughs> that is my tree house where I play. I live in a red brick building with my mom, dad, and baby sister. Oh, I live with my family too, all 23 of us. My mom, dad, sister, brother, grandmother, grandfather, aunties, uncles, cousins, and our animals. Mm -hmm. A great river flows through my village. Peacocks dance under trees shaped like umbrellas. The sun is giant and especially hot here. In my city, the sun hides behind buildings as tall as the sky. Taxis, buses, and cars fill the streets. My favorite class is art, where I can be anything. My favorite class is yoga, where I can be anything. Same, same, but different. This is how my friends and I say hello. This is how my friends and I say hello. Namaste. Same, same, but different. We are best friends, even though we live in two different worlds. Or do we? Different, different, but the same. And I really love that text to share with students, early education students, but even high schoolers and adults can benefit from listening to a book, a story, story, the power story bringing us together, and the power of a picture book. And this is one that can, if you're having students who are struggling with peer conflicts, this is a go-to for having, you know, the conversation of, yeah, you might not think the same or your interests might not be the same, but you're both here in this space together working towards being the best person you can be. And I think what it shows, uh, again, regardless of the age of the reader, is that there are differences, there are things about your upbringing and your culture that have framed who you are and the way you see the world. But at the same time, there are so many differences and there are so many similarities and overlaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both work at you know, diverse schools, but it's not a diverse school if you don't embrace that diversity you recognize differences and you accept them and you you grow from them. So exactly. it's a wonderful uh, text. Mm -hmm. I'm also gonna read a text here. Um, and so if you could go to the next slide, you know, we're from Chicago and uh, that's the way the roads look after the winter. We get these big old potholes that you, uh, that that's actually nothing for us. We, <laughs> we don't even hardly blink an eye when we see that in the middle of the road. Um, that image matches up with this short poem uh, by Portia Nelson. It's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. 
It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend that I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in this same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down another street. This piece, as you can tell, it's very short, um, pretty clear in, in some of the messages that it delivers. You know, I've used this one-on-one -on -one working through working through an issue with a student, in particular students who kind of become my regulars. Uh, they mm -hmm. get a lot of referrals and they're my office a lot. And maybe it's for this making is the, that. Like literally we've had this same conversation about right. 57 times <laughs> just last week. <laughs> right. But you know, we're, so what chapter do you think that you are in right now? And the students yeah, will be, be very honest. Like I am stuck in chapter two. I keep blaming everybody else. And that's powerful from how to take them from chapter two to chapter three. I think something important in my role, but I would say in any role you're in in education is, you know, a kid who has 25 referrals or 30 referrals, they're not a bad person, you know, like they're showing you that they're struggling to manage their behavior. And, you know, I've had students where uh, we come to find out, oh, they're struggling, but they're only struggling during this time of day, mm -hmm. or they're only struggling dur during this type of class. And, um, you know, I think it kind of says like, let's look at this. Let's think it through. Mm -hmm. What's my role in this? Mm -hmm. You know, when they say, oh, it is my fault, but mm -hmm. I still didn't make any different choices. Mm -hmm. And now recognizing, no, I have choices and mm -hmm. I can make different choices. Um, and so I'm going to talk about something later in the presentation where I've done something like this with a group of students and I just sit back and listen to them and mm -hmm. they come up with wonderful uh, connections and things that that show that they're thinking because that's what we want. We want them to think about how to conduct yourself and how to manage your your frustrations, which mm -hmm. we all have, ch child or adult. Mm -hmm. I also, now that I'm thinking about it, I really like the idea of autobiography in five short chapters to listen to the stories that teachers are telling one another in their schools. Because I think a lot of times our language is either showing that we are um, accepting our roles and our responsibilities, or we're kind of passing it off and blaming it on something, even even what we're going to do later, you know, you know, say question the structure and the systems, you know, are, we have to make sure we're be careful not to place blame on, well, I'm helpless because the system is so broken. And where are we at as educators in our autobiography of five short chapters? So that was starting to talk about just text immersion, which is going to be a theme throughout the whole presentation. Yeah. So our, our second big main point that we want to make is the the power of the coaching conversation. The fact that whenever you have a student one on one, whether it's after a problem, problem behavior mm -hmm. has already occurred. See, I don't even like that word problem. <laughs> but after a challenge behavior has already occurred or or before or even just in the little everyday conversations you have with the students in the hallway to build those relationships through coaching conversations. And in their book, Better Than Carrots or Sticks, Restorative Practices for Classroom Management, um, Smith, Fisher, and Frey cover um, a variety of restorative practices that really help um, to bring the philosophy of shifting from punitive, consequence-driven to restorative. But even that, when I read from the lens of a global meaning maker, I would carefully read because there are times when I would even want to challenge the authors that um, some of the work, the way that it's framed is still, you know, we are, the teachers are the ones who are, you know, doing all the structural work and putting it on the students. And we want to try to bring, pull the students in earlier in the process. So we felt that, that that quote about the power of language is really important to having those restorative practices. 
You know, restorative justice and restorative practices, that's something you hear all the time. It's mm -hmm. a catchy phrase, but um, what does it really look like? What does it really mean? And at the heart of it is the relationships. Um, as I said before, I have students who are kind of commonly referred to my office. And on the one hand, it that's kind of disheartening. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, again, they're, they're showing that they need some more support than what they're getting. And I try to offer that. Um, sometimes I struggle in my role, though. And, and I think if you look at education or, or a school building as a, as a system, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many different people with so many different thoughts. And, you know, I'm considered the discipline um, administrator. And I'll read a referral that a kid, a kid is given like an ultimatum where okay. it's like, you need to do this or you're going to go see your administrator. And the kid will say, I want to go see my administrator. And I don't know how the teacher then perceives that because mm -hmm. I've tried hard to build positive relationships with my students. And, you know, when they're given that ultimatum, they, they see me as someone they can go to mm -hmm. and try to work through the frustration they're having. Mm -hmm. My hope is that the teacher also understands that and that I will then try my best to help the student get them back refocused and back in that classroom where we want them to be in the first place. Yeah, I guess I think the thing that's the biggest challenge with that is how how to have the conversations, those coaching conversations with the student that both, you know, um, build their identity and build, you know, and support the fact, support them where they're at, you know, the idea that the coaching conversations are what is lifting them up and supporting them. And, you know, I just... And, and realizing that that conversation might have to take place more than one time. It, you know, we, we have our own children and it's like, we've talked about this. Yeah. We've talked about this. Oh my gosh, um, don't even get me started on our own children. Uh, they're good kids, <laughs> but they need that same thing several times and and so do the students we teach exactly um, Dana just mentioned identity and uh, you know it's a huge part of what we do it should be mm -hmm. a huge part of what we do is helping students uh, I identify and and know that you know they have identities many identities mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately one of the things I struggle with is that sometimes your identity is not something you're able to determine but it's put mm -hmm. on you kind yes. of like I said when a kid has 25 referrals that identity of being a bad kid or a troubled kid or whatever, it's already placed on them. I could, I mean, by fifth grade, I have <laughs> students who have already identified I'm the bad kid and they talk about that. And I have one student in particular who only now in, at this point of the year is even considering the possibility that he's not a bad kid because He's an amazing kid. I mean, he's a global meaning maker. That's actually part of the reason why he's struggling so much is because a lot of things don't make sense to him. And so he's challenging and he's pushing back and and he's questioning now, you know, that we've talked about, you know, tone and how to have these respectful conversations. But it's still, you know, I have to help him see that he's not he's more than just these referrals. And that comes from the power of the conversations and using your language to show that you welcome their identity, all parts of their identity, even their struggler identity, their identity of being impulsive or having a hard time making a smart choice, mm -hmm. that that's not, you know, a bad part of who they are, that everybody has their different, mm -hmm. you know. And, and something I try to uh, bring to what I do and model even is vulnerability, vulnerability. Um, you know, I think great things come when you put yourself out there and are vulnerable. And so, you know, I'll use my own real life experiences with students when I'm having these uh, important conversations and then they might feel that they can do that. Because, mm -hmm. again, a huge part of this job is to listen and, and not listen in a, in a place of value judging and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So, you know, if if I can show vulnerability, whether it's in a student administrator relationship or administrator teacher relationship mm -hmm. or whatever that may be that's where growth comes from mm -hmm. is getting through that saying having that difficult conversation and then coming out understanding each other a little bit better mm -hmm. and so as we really want to help support students with their different identities and making sure that they're visible and they're visible in our speech and in our language and acknowledging them but they're also visible in our texts 
So I would like to read a little bit from We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices. It's a great collection that I'm sure so many of you already <laughs> know and use and love like I do. But I am reading um, today just an excerpt from Tell It In Your Own Way by Roy Bonnie Jr. And he says, <clears throat> I am a full blood Cherokee artist from a small town called Locust Grove, Oklahoma. I've been drawing as long as I can remember. Growing up, I used to watch a lot of cartoons and read lots of comic books. Now that I'm adult, I still do. As a kid, I spent hours trying to draw what I saw on screen and on the page. Sometimes I'd get in trouble because I was drawing in class and teachers thought I wasn't paying attention. Doodling helped me focus on what the teacher was saying, even if I appeared not to be listening. I grew up in a family where many people spoke the Cherokee language. I never thought it was unique until I got older and realized that my experience as a Native American was different from a lot of other kids. No one in my family had gone to college, so I never gave it much thought either. I thought of drawing only as a hobby. Fortunately, one of my art teachers saw how much I loved drawing. He encouraged me to consider going to college to study art. And what I love so much, and, and he goes on and shares a lot more identity aspects, but what I love so much about that is I have had multiple students through the years who struggle for this very reason. And it's just one example of something that's that falls within that realm of discipline, like what does it look like to be an engaged student? What does it look like to be respectful to the teacher when the teacher you know, is sharing something which should be a shared space with the students as well? And- well, I mean, we've both, I'm speaking for you now <laughs> and, and myself, but we've both sat at meetings and drawn little doodles, you mm -hmm. know, but I'm listening and I'll question or, or challenge an idea or ask a, a, a question. and. Um, you know, there are some pieces of, of that short text you read that really hit me. Uh, and one is when he says that, you know, I could get in trouble for that and be seen again as a kid off task, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not focused. Mm -hmm. Let and me I've send had students who have that identity for that particular purpose. Right. And if mm -hmm. the first reaction of the teacher is discipline, discipline, referral, and that type of thing, that can really shut down the student mm -hmm. who maybe is trying to, exactly. to focus by doing that. Um, I'd be like, here, I'll buy you all the notebooks you need, like document everything in art. You know, right. let's like let's take our experiences, this lesson that we just shared together and and turn it into an art right. creation. And that adds so much value that when and again, we're not really talking very much about, you know, pedagogy in the classroom in terms of instruction, because that's where it really starts is having, you know, innovative mm -hmm. engaging instruction but well letting a student like that even show their learning yeah, through exactly, art exactly. um but the other thing that struck me was that when he does look back at kind of a very impactful part of his his educational career um he says there was a teacher that noticed it in me mm -hmm. and it shows kind of both sides of it the mm -hmm. teacher could just be the one that says put that drawing away and what are mm -hmm. you thinking well or, or worst case scenario here's a referral this is the third time. Yeah. Now I expect that you're going to get, you know, some sort of, right. You know, a, a harsher mm, consequence, yeah, consequence. Or, whatever. or be the person that notices that power and notices that talent that that mm -hmm. kid has and encourages it. And so for this particular person that made all the difference, mm -hmm. he went on to college, got an art degree is in this wonderful text that we shared today. Um, and so it kind of shows that the teacher in either case is, is kind of the one that can, Mm -hmm. show which trajectory mm -hmm. it takes. I mean, we really we really can put them with the way we embrace them on different paths, depending on, on whether we are, you know, restoring, being restorative, mm -hmm. or whether we are being disciplinarians who join the Consequence Brigade, where the story that the teachers who are on that brigade or in that bandwagon are telling themselves is that the reason why the students are misbehaving is because they're not given enough consequences. And if we only gave them more consequences, then they would realize that we're serious about what we mean. 
And I mean, I've caught myself trying to use a consequence as a way because there there is, you know, some mm -hmm. understanding that that there are natural consequences and that there are other consequences as well. So yeah, if the student misses out on some key information because they were too much into that drawing, you have a conversation about that, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, you you didn't really grasp what we were covering today. I think you kind of got lost in your art today. Yeah. And, and you have that kind of conversation. Um, right. You know, I also like the part where he talks about growing up and speaking Cherokee and not even knowing that was different or, or unique, I guess, uh, until he gets to school. Now, hopefully when he got to that school, it was seen as something amazing. I always tell my students who are bilingual, I'm envious. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm so happy that they have that ability and, mm -hmm. and that talent. And, um, and that brings us to the, to the next read, uh, the next text. So this is uh, Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. And uh, he's a comedian and he grew up in South Africa uh, during apartheid. And I can relate to Trevor Noah in some ways. He's biracial. Actually, uh, in South Africa, he would be known as colored uh, during the apartheid. It was black, white, or colored. And it was actually a crime to, to be in a, you know, the result, I guess, of a biracial relationship. And I'm biracial. But, um, you know, I've struggled with my racial identity all through my life and even into adulthood. And still, yeah, even, there's still people who want to tell me that he's Puerto Rican. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You know, so it's a, <laughs> a topic that is uh, very hard to navigate. And that's for me struggling as an adult. I can only imagine as a young child in a school also feeling that way. So here's a little excerpt from uh, Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. Language brings with it an identity and a culture, or at least the perception of it. A shared language says we are the same. A language barrier says we are different. The architects of apartheid understood this. Part of the effort to divide black people was to make sure we were separated, not just physically, but by language as well. In the Bantu schools, schools, children were only taught in their home language. Zulu kids learned in Zulu. Swana kids learned in Swana. Because of this, we'd fall into the trap the government had set for us and fight among ourselves, believing that we were different. The great thing about language is that you can just as easily use it to do the opposite, convince people that they are the same. Racism teaches us that we are different because of the color of our skin. But because racism is stupid, it's easily tricked. If you're racist and you meet someone who doesn't look like you, the fact that he can't speak like you reinforces your racist preconceptions. He's different, less intelligent. A brilliant scientist can come over the border from Mexico to live in America, but if he speaks in broken English, people say, eh, I don't trust this guy. But he's a scientist. In Mexican science, maybe, I don't trust him. However, if the person who doesn't look like you speaks like you, your brain short circuits because your racism program has none of those instructions in the code. Wait, wait, your mind says, the racism code says, if he doesn't look like me, he isn't like me. But the language code says, if he speaks like me, he is like me. Something is off here. I can't figure this out. Um, and, and so, you know, he talks about language a lot in this. And that's something we've been talking about a lot in our presentation, um, the power of language. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, Dana and I, as we were creating this presentation, talked about how we want to have like a common language, but then we even found ourselves going back and uh, forth like on that. Common because the issue with that, and I, I listen with like, we need like the language can bring us together, but then common language, like whose language who gets to be the common language. But goes and, to the code switching thing again, exactly. where it's like, this is the way to be. You might be this. Mm -hmm. We You need to be this <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. other thing. Um, and so there is some problematic things there. But when, when we were thinking of the common language, it's more, the common culture of, of a school where differences back to same, same, but different, mm -hmm. you know, they're powerful. They, they're, they're things to celebrate, but also to realize we're united in so many other ways. Absolutely. Uh, so we've shared a lot of books and we talk a lot about making sure you incorporate all kinds of different texts and songs, music, identity and music is one thing that, is can be powerful. Can, it's very powerful and you can do it anytime. You can put music on and decide to soak up the lyrics. 
My personal favorite um, way of developing the text set that I have is it started on Pandora. Mm -hmm. It started with the Wyclef station. <laughs> and as you like or dislike different songs, you know, it makes your adjustments. And then I find myself with all kinds of different songs and different genres. But as I'm listening with the lens of how can I think of music as a way to help my students who are struggling, I think that that gives me um, a different way of thinking. And so I, I could share a million different songs with you. And I really struggled on you know deciding what. I wanted to just name all the different songs. But if you, you can take my path, start with Wyclef or start with one of your choice because, mm -hmm. you know, that pulls in common and then we are getting get, getting into Indie Iri and bringing in and all that. But also the song Mansion by NF, um, I think really is powerful for students who might be struggling because it offers a metaphor for them to grapple with and to make their struggle more maybe more tangible or to give a way to speak to it. So this is Mansion by NF, and should I sing it? <laughs> oh, don't sing, please, no. <laughs> Neither of us are singers, but the lyrics are powerful. That was not going to happen. So <laughs> once you heard music, it wasn't going to be me singing. <laughs> so the lyrics say, My mind is a house with walls covered in lyrics. They're all over the place. There's songs in the mirrors, written all over the floors, all over the chairs. And you get the uncut version of life when I go downstairs. That's where I write when I need, when I'm in a bad place and I need to release. I put holes in the wall with both fists till they bleed. You might get a glimpse of how I cope with all this anger in me. I regret the fact that I struggle to find out who I am and I lie to myself and say I do the best that I can. Shrug it off like it ain't nothing like it's out of my hands then get ticked off whenever i see it's affecting my plans and i regret watching these trust issues eat me alive broken legs but i chase perfection these walls are my blink expression my mind is a home that i'm trapped in and it's lonely inside this mansion very powerful words uh, and lyrics. And, you know, I thought about a particular student of mine where, uh, again, 20 something referrals uh, her freshman year and has grown tremendously and matured so much over two years. And as a junior now, hardly has any referrals at all. But um, she would punch anything that was out there, lockers, walls, until her knuckles were practically bleeding. And you have to understand these students are coming from all sorts of things, you know, and our school is starting to really look at trauma and how that affects students and impacts mm -hmm. students. And uh, it's another, trying to become, yeah, it's another, buzzword. it's great that we're, we're on that path, but it's becoming a buzzword in a way that, that can be problematic. True. Which is why we really want to go forward and leave you with our final mm -hmm. um, main point for the day or for yeah. the session. Yeah. So when we talk about, policies and systems and structures and, and questioning those because um, again I think we're all here on this ed collab gathering that is so wonderful uh, because we know there are there's still growth to out there for us and you know is our system perfect no but we can mm -hmm. we can make it better and so we shouldn't fall back on old practices just because it's the way we do it um, and uh, the text I'm going to share with you uh, the quote on there is from Cornelius Miners we got this uh, equity, access, and the quest to be who our students need us to be. So, you know, when confronted with the unknown that is often associated with our deepest convictions and biggest dreams, it is much more comfortable to return to orthodoxy than it is to step into the void. And so, as I said before, you know, being vulnerable as an individual, but also as a system, you know, we have mm -hmm. to understand that um, education is not perfect. It is not meeting all of our students' needs. And one thing I'm doing uh, you know, I don't love the idea that we're giving detentions to students for some things that really ought to be detentions just opportunities to learn, detentions and suspensions. Mm -hmm. So one thing I'm doing is taking something that might be problematic and trying to make it a little bit better. And so I'm doing something called detention with dialogue. And basically, uh, when these students are there, I'm, I'm bringing them these texts and showing TED Talks and, and things like that. And then sit back and listen mm -hmm. and hear them 
talk about it. So mm -hmm. uh, when when I did uh, autobiography in five short chapters, these kids took took off with it, and we're mm -hmm. talking about drug abuse and peer pressure and all of these things that are in their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even had a student the next day come up to me who was not a part of it and said, "I heard you guys were talking about," and and mm -hmm. it had impacted that. So that meant that that student took that. And, and brought it back to another friend of theirs and talked about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that dialogue, you know, that's a powerful thing. That's mm -hmm. a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana has a, a, another great example of this as well. Yeah, so just like detentions are problematic, detentions and suspensions are problematic at the high school level, they're problematic at the elementary school level too. And um, I, I have quite a few students who struggle to fit into the norms that we've decided as a school culture are the norms that the students must adhere to. And for good and for bad, there have been, you know, the, the learning curve has been steep for me this year with the particular group that I have. And I put together a kit that I'm calling it a suspension kit, which I hate that name. So if help any of you out there help on Twitter, <laughs> please help me think of a better dream name to give this kit. But really what it is, is it's nothing glorious yet. I mean, literally this is the <laughs> folder that has, you know, the last student I gave it to, you know, maybe they spent time reading and reflecting on what's in here, but maybe they also just made a nice, you know, eraser design on the front <laughs> of the cover. But in there is filled with, you know, I have um, some scenario cards. The scenario cards, I pulled, you know, some of those scenarios straight off of the Teaching Tolerance website. And I wrote, um, you know, just reflecting some thought reflecting questions. questions or even, you know, I, everyone either has like a read, mm -hmm. a write or a draw opportunity. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to draw and show their thinking, you know, in mm -hmm. that way. But unfortunately, what this looks like a lot of times is that student, in at least in my school, who was given an in-school suspension is spending their entire time in a room in the office by themselves without having the peers to have those conversations with. And I'll get the phone call from the, the secretary saying, you know, so-and-so will be down in the office, please send some work. And that's impossible to do when being in the classroom is essential. You know, I can't just hand off some worksheets. That, a community of learners. A community of learners. So they can't get that community alone in the office. But I try to do my best that I can. And, you know, trying to buffer, you know, I don't agree with the system, but I've questioned it. I've made my ideas clear in a respectful way and I'm pushing on it by you know creating some alternative experiences so I've got scenario cards I fill it with articles you know I've got you know what you know I just collect every time I see things you know when I was a bully the song lyrics you know students then could and annotate, annotate and, and read on. you know different this one there's a couple of students video game addiction a real problem study finds they will be reading that. You can do a cell phone article as well, I'm sure. Right, and I even, school. I know we're talking about literacy, but I even have, it, it's, it is literacy still. Yes, it is. Um, even I have some math tasks. So this one is just called Cyberbullying by Gender, and I've provided a table with some data on there, and the types of questions I give are meant to challenge their thinking from that global meaning maker perspective. And I've just been building it. It started small and building it a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the students who are getting these suspensions are getting them for situations that I wasn't involved in and I wasn't a part of, and I didn't get the opportunity to sit next to them and coach them through their challenge. And I was just told, send this stuff. Right. So. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Jessica, I, I'm only gonna touch on this very briefly, um, but it's something that is uh, prevalent in our school is we deal with the uh, dress code violations quite frequently and one of the things is about uh, hoods and and headwear like a do-rag let's say um, that's going to target your african-american population a lot more and, and also, you've even seen it impact muslim students as well too with other students showing intolerance because right they can't wear their hood or their right. hat so why do they you know right. and it creates tension between the students. So, um, you know, one thing I think is this, if 7.30 a.m., the first interaction a student is having with an adult in our building is take off your hood, 
um, it's kind of insensitive to to just everything about that kid's situation. You know, I talked about trauma a little while ago. This kid may have just experienced something traumatic the night before and spent the whole night crying. And to them, that hood is kind of their invisibility cloak. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we are just calling that into question right away. Evanston Township High School has put out a dress code policy here. Um, and I'm not gonna go over the whole thing here at all, but it's just obvious that their philosophy is to decrease the marginalization and the oppression that anyone might feel based on gender, uh, race, ethnicity, religion, any of those things. And the more we can try to uh, have practices like this, the better it's gonna be for everyone in our learning community. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and you could advance. I know we're running short on time. Well, and <laughs> a actually, I think I'd like to even just kind of close it. I mean, because the dress code, it comes back to like, I guess the, we like to argue sometimes that like wearing a hood or not spitting out gum, that the students are reacting with um, disrespect or something like that. And then they're being written up for disrespect. And mm -hmm. that was a word that we didn't get to, but I kind of want to leave it's the online. audience with it, with that idea about disrespect and how, um, how that might look in a problematic way when you're looking at it from a global meaning maker perspective. And I think that that's absolutely really yeah. like if you can work on maybe reframing and consciously looking for that word disrespect and noticing, you know, when students are told they're being disrespectful, um, maybe pause and reframe and rethink about that whole situation, the whole situation. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's so much more we would love yeah. to talk about, and I hopefully, have, like, stacks <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> we've all we're creating this network where all educators can can question together and and reflect together. So, thank you so much today, uh, and for the presentations and for listening to ours. Yes. Thank you. Oh my gosh! Thank you guys so much. Woo, I was like furiously like writing notes and adding books to my um, my wish list. Um, thank you guys so much for for giving us so many amazing resources to lift students up, to honor their identities. Oh, you're gonna cry! <laughs> and for helping us build student relationships. Um, and most importantly, for getting us thinking about the need to question traditional disciplinary systems. So. Um, Thank you guys again for all of your passion and your hard work. Make sure you check out Twitter because there was a lot of people agreeing and um, just praising your your words and ideas and your work. So um, I'm going to dry my tears and pull it together. And um, and audience, if you uh, popped in in the middle of the session and you want to watch the entire thing, don't worry. It's going to be archived on the Ed Collab site so you can watch it from beginning to end. Um, we have a 15 minute break here, so be sure to get up, stretch. Get ready for session four at two o'clock, starting in about 12 minutes. Um, and thank you again, Dana and Justin, for joining us today. Thank you very much.